Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on the time zone that you're in. But today, whatever time it is, I want to encourage you. I want to talk about overcoming the fear of failure. Overcoming the fear of failure. Now, I don't know about you, but I've had plenty of fear of failure, and it stopped me from doing so many beautiful things. Only when I get to heaven, and maybe you know, God will allow me to kind of view where my fear of failure got me in life, I think we'll all be very surprised. But there's a wonderful scripture in Proverbs that's helped me a lot. And it says this, Proverbs 24, verse 16. It says, the righteous person falls or fails seven times and rises again. Okay, I, I mean, say if I rewrote the Bible and I said the righteous person only falls one time and hopefully will rise again. But it doesn't say that. It says the perfect, the, the person that's close to God, the, the righteous person, the holy person, you know, falls, fails seven times. That's a multiplicity of times, but he rises again. In other words, it's okay to fail. It's okay to, to have this fear of failure, but you know we will rise again. So I don't know, maybe you started a business. Um, I rem I've started things in my life. I'm a guitar player. I remember when I first started giving concerts and I was so nervous and I failed more than seven times. Even when I was preaching, I certainly failed more than seven times. Even when I started television, I failed more than seven times. I humiliated myself, I embarrassed myself, but somehow I pushed through that and God enabled me to rise again. So, if you think you're, okay, this is said the righteous person. Imagine if it said the stupid person or the idiot falls seven times, okay? It doesn't say that. It says the holy person, the righteous person, the person that's close to God falls or fails seven times, but rises again. So that's a, that's a wonderful promise. So maybe you've fallen down. Maybe you're not happy where you are in life. Maybe you have all of these regrets and say, oh yes, I, I deserve it. You know, look, I'm in this dead end life. Nothing's working out for me. But it says that you will rise again. So that's what we want to talk about today, okay? In fact, I think our dreams are always on the other side of our failures. Think about it. Say if you want something that seems almost unattainable. I tell you, but your dreams, that dream that you have is always on the other side of failure. I remember when I was 10 years old and I wanted to impress this girl called Carol. It's amazing, I still remember her name and that's what, 50 years ago. And I, of course, you know, in those days you thought you had to impress girls by doing, phys taking physical risks. <laughs> So I climbed up this tree and I boldly told everybody that I was gonna jump off the tree. And so I went on to the top of that tree and I was feeling all good about myself and suddenly I looked down. And wow, it wasn't just the fear of jumping off the height, but I think the greatest fear was what if I failed? What if I didn't jump and I had to go down and face that girl. Man, they would mock me. I would, I, I would get, you know, people would be laughing at me and making jokes about me for the rest of the school year. So I knew I had to do it, but I was battling with that fear, the physical fear of jumping off. Maybe I'm gonna die or get paralyzed, but I was also, you know, wrestling with the fear of that potential failure. So eventually I did jump off, you know, and I just remember the feeling, I sank down in the water and I just could imagine her swimming over and giving me a kiss or something at 10 years of age, but none of that happened. I guess I didn't impress her, maybe I should have went higher up, I don't know. But that's something, you know, it's like, like everything we want in life, even when God gives us a commandment and it says, Kurt, I want you to, to start speaking on Revelation TV. Man, just coming on Revelation TV, I had a huge fear of failure because when Melanie started a Christian television station in South Africa, 
Um, she kind of hired me, you know, uh, to do a book report, a simple book report that I could probably do well without even having read the book now. But back then, I just froze and I failed miserably on television. And I didn't wait to fail seven times. I think I just failed once or twice. And I said, that's enough for me. I will never be on television again. I will never do that again. And then years and years later, we meet Howard and Leslie and uh, Gordon and Lorna, and they say, Kurt, we would like you to be on television. And immediately, the fear of failure hit me, and I said, there's no way my wife can do it. She was a television um, professional in South Africa, not me. But eventually, I think it took them a little more than a year just to encourage me to get in front of a camera and overcome my fear of failure. Now, I love this. I love talking to you guys. I'm so relaxed. There's no nervous. I just, I love people. I want to help people. This is probably one of the most joyful things I do in my life, being on television, communicating to people all around the world. It's lovely. But what, what if I caved in to the fear of failure? What if I didn't do that? What if I just shrunk back and I didn't press in? So again, the righteous person falls seven times and rises again. Um, one of my favorite presidents, probably not be too politically correct these days, was Theodore or Teddy Roosevelt. And he was a crazy guy. I mean, soldier of fortune, you just go on. I mean, you read his, his biography or his autobiography, and you can't believe that a human being with disabilities, okay, did as much as Teddy Roosevelt. But he had a lot of experience with overcoming his fears and talking about dream, even the dream of becoming president of the United States was on the other side of failure. And he says this, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who's falling seven times, I might add, who strives valiantly, who fails, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without failure, no error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds? Who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end, okay, the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, okay, at least fails while daring greatly. And I think this is something that God asks for us. I'm thinking, of course, Peter in the boat, okay? And Peter says, oh, if that's you, Jesus, I want to come out and meet you right now. And Peter gets out. And for a few minutes or a few seconds, he manages to walk on the water, and then he, think, then he sinks. But probably the other disciples in the boat are saying, man, if that was me, man, he should have just like not had faith. And, you know, we tend to, to kind of focus on his dirt more than his gold. But man, even if I was walking on water for five seconds, I would love to know the thrill of walking on water, even if I failed and I sank. And I could say to you on television, guess what, guys? Yesterday, I was just not walking on the beach. I was walking on the water on the beach. But I can't say that. That's never happened to me before. I, I used a water ski, and I tried water skiing once in bare feet. It didn't work out. I envied the people who tried. But, you know, if, if uh, our dream or God's call on our life is beyond, you know, the other side of our failure, we have to get used to this. And then again... The righteous person, like Peter, falls seven times and rises again. So I want to share briefly three ways to overcome the fear of failure. Three ways that we can implement right now that will help us to overcome the fear of failure. Number one, very not too obvious, focus on the upside of failure. Failure always has an upside. Like Peter, when he walked on the water, the downsides was he sunk down in the water. 
the upside was that he actually spent five seconds walking on the water. So we can choose to focus on the downside of him sinking, okay, or the upside, him walking up on top of the water. And Michael Jordan, very famous basketball player in my country, in America, he says this, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot, and I missed. I failed over and over and over again in my life, and that is why I succeed. The righteous person, you memorize this, falls seven times and rises um, again. I, I, Gary Cohen, I don't know if you know this, but if you look at all the CEOs in the world, so many of them were dyslexic. So many of them had childhood physical conditions that they had to negotiate and overcome, but it made them stronger. It made them stronger because they focused on the upside of their dyslexia and not on the downside. For example, Gary Kahn, who's a, who is the president and chief operating officer of Goldman Sachs, in other words, a multi, multi-millionaire. But he didn't start out like that. His teacher said to his mother, maybe, maybe, if he's lucky in life, he could be a truck driver, okay? And so this is what Gary Kahn himself has to say about focusing on the upside of failure. My upbringing allowed me to be comfortable with failure. The one trait in a lot of dyslexic people I know is that by the time we got out of college, our ability to deal with failure was very, very highly developed. And so we look at most situations and see much more of the upside than the downside. Because we're so accustomed to the downside, it doesn't phase us. I've thought about it many times. I, I really have because it defined who I am. I wouldn't be where I am today without my dyslexia. I never would have taken that first chance. So the Christian life, I can read that again. The righteous person falls seven times. And I could end, oh, where's all your holiness getting to? Oh, you say Jesus is coming back. I could focus and I could stomp you down on the ground and make you feel so miserable. But that's what the devil does. It's true. God knocks us down sometimes, but not to stay down. He'll always pull us up. That's always his will. That's always an in his intention. But I could take that verse and just focus on falling and failing seven times to the exclusion, and he rises again. You see? It's, are you focusing on the downside of your life or on the upside of of your life. And I love this in Josh, Joshua chapter 7, verse 3. It says, Joshua cried out to the Lord, O oh Lord, why have you brought us over the Jordan River if you are going to let the Amorites kill us? Okay? Why weren't we content with what we had? Why didn't we stay on the other side? O oh Lord, what am I to do now that Israel has fled from her enemies? For when the Canaanites and the other nearby nations hear about it, they will surround us and attack us and wipe us out. And then what will happen to the honor of your great name? But the Lord said to Joshua, what? Stay down, you know, stay down another two hours? No, he said, get your face out of the dirt, get up. Get your face out of the dirt and get up. So he failed seven times easily. Okay, a righteous man, but God said, you know what? Get up, deal with it, move forward, okay? So number one, dealing with the fear of failure, focus on the upside or learn, okay, to focus on the upside of failure. It's difficult. Number two, don't face failure alone. I don't know what it is, but as a pastor, when people have bad things happen to them, they don't go to their friends, they just isolate. So when they're, in, when they're in that difficult place, when they're in that dry place, you know, what they want to do is they just want to get away from people and isolate themselves where they're not going to get any help. I, I know people just say, oh, I just want to spend time with God. But what if you're praying for encouragement and you go up to the mountain, I don't know, and spend the whole night there, God, encourage me, God, encourage me. And what if God says, hey, I've given 
you, your friend Pete, actually, who lives in this neighborhood, why don't you drive over there? Because I've given Pete the gift of, of discernment, the gift of encouragement. And when you go and hang out with Pete, then you will get encouragement. That's why Paul can write and to, and he says, look, Epaphroditus, you've refreshed me. You see, you've refreshed me because God has gifted the church with people. But I've seen in my ministry for so many years, whenever somebody is in, usually in a difficult situation, they withdraw, they isolate themselves, and they try to face failure alone, and they just, oh, they, they shrink back, and then the patterns happen over and over and over and over again. But um, I like um, this book by Henry Cloud. It's called The Power of the Other. And he tells a story about his brother-in-law, who was this Marine. And unfortunately, he died a, a few years ago, I think, in Afghanistan. But his, uh, a friend at the funeral of his brother-in-law, a friend, was telling Dr. Henry Cloud, he was saying, I want you to know that your brother-in-law was an incredible hero. Not only was he an incredible hero, but he had the gift of encouragement. And he said, like, for, for example, me, when we were going, undergoing Hell Week, and I couldn't, we were swimming across this lake, I was going to sink, I was going to drown. I couldn't take one more, no matter what I did. I didn't have any resources, no power, no energy. I couldn't even do one more stroke. And it was your brother-in-law that said, you can do it. And it's when he said that, suddenly this energy and power entered him and he was able to do it. I don't know about you, but maybe you've had a teacher, a friend, a pastor, and you've had no energy. And that person just looks at you and says, you can do it. You can do it. So breakthroughs are not going to happen. They usually don't happen alone. They happen with other people. And that's what Ecclesiastes 4, 9 says. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, okay, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. And if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. Folks, make deep friendships. Make deep friendships with good people. Number three, focus on the finish line. Don't focus on what's right in front of you, you're going to get depressed. I, I was taking a walk just a couple days ago, and I was just like focusing, I, you know, I saw the road and it said, there's no way I can get up there, you know, but I just focused on that finish line and said, yes, I can do it. And there's so much power. And then I looked down at the road and I was just looking at my feet. Oh, I'll never get up there. I'll never get up there. Looking at the finish line and I knew the restaurant was by there. I knew I was going to have something nice to drink. And that encouraged me. So. I don't know if you remember an interview that Melanie and I did on Insight Live with Iona Rossley, who was a champion speed skier uh, for, for the UK. And she said, when she goes down that hill, okay, she says, and she's reaching like 160 miles per hour, something like that. She says, if one negative thought enters your mind, when you're going down there, your life could be over. And they had to sew back. They had to sew back her leg onto her because she did let a negative thought come. So I think really we have to focus on the finish line, not just what's in front of us. And that's what Hebrews 12 says. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. So I think this is important. I know when, when you're learning the drive, you know, when I learned the drive and with a stick shift and so on, a manual, I would always like focus on the stick shift, focus on the road right in front of me. And then, you know, the driving instructor had to jam on the brakes because, you know, I was going to go off course. But now when I drive, I don't look at the gear shift. I don't look at the road directly in front of me. I fix my eyes on the horizon, on my destination, and that really um, helps me a lot. So I want to challenge all of us when to, the best ways of overcoming the fear of failure. Number one, focus on the upside of failure, not the sinking part, but the walking on the water part, you know. 
Number um, two, don't face failure alone. Even though everything in you says, I just want to be alone. I don't want anybody to know about my problems. I don't want to burden anybody. Look, there are people that would love to help you. All you have to do is ask for help. I remember Steve Jobs, for example, he said, never the founder of Apple, he said, the secret of my success is I always found somebody who could help me. And he tells wonderful stories. So always ask. If you don't you know, ask, you're not going to receive. And number three, um, don't face, not, it's not that, focus on the finish line and not the obstacles that are directly in front of you. And I want to leave you with this verse, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 16 and 18, and go through it. It says, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Isn't this amazing that you know, often I read this to audiences. I was reading this to 400 non-Christians in Geneva. It was amazing. And I just read this verse. I explained this verse. And this verse, and even though they were non-Christian people, and it was a non-Christian event, people came for prayer after, after I shared this, even though they weren't believers. But check this out. Number one, it says, this is overcoming the fear of failure. Rejoice always. This is hard, this is a skill, this is something that you have to cultivate, you know. There will always be, even though we failed, at the, even though we're down at the dirt, there is something, no matter how small it is, that we can rejoice. Like I can just say, God, phew, man, everything's going wrong in my life, <laughs> okay? But, uh, but I have this glass of water. I remember when I was first married, the first year of our marriage, and I had a terrible bicycle accident. My face was all bloody and the tooth was out and Melanie looked at me, my wife, and burst out into tears. And, and then, you know, we didn't have any money at that time. And then Melanie's car broke down. She lost her job. And, and things just got so bad. And of course we knew that scripture, rejoice always. And, you know, God is not asking you suddenly your child dies and you have to rejoice like that. that that's cruel. But even when our son had cancer, even when we were in that situation, we found something, something very insignificant, small, and we rejoiced over that. And, and when we did that, it was amazing. Somebody put, say, the equivalent of 500 pounds through our window. Now, maybe somebody overheard us where we lived, so, you know, I, I still praise God for that. But then suddenly, um, we get a letter in the post, and we've received an inheritance of $50,000. <laughs> that was great. And then we get a phone call from my father saying, I've just bought you two tickets to America. And then Melanie gets another couple of phone calls offering her so much work that she had to turn the work down. So I'm saying there's something really powerful. I don't want to say this is a formula, but something so powerful when we rejoice. When we, like Gary Kahn, the CEO of uh, Goldman Sachs, he said, we're accustomed. Other people are accustomed to seeing, only seeing the downside of failure. But we, these, we, the dyslexic people that have made it, you know, like Sir Richard Branson, that's a good one for the UK, we tend to focus and we tend to rejoice on the upside of our failures, okay? So that's what it means about rejoicing always. And there's so much power in this. Then he goes on in terms of conquering the spirit of fear. Pray, pray continually. Man, I have been paralyzed when I was up on that tree trying to impress that girl, knowing that I had to jump off that tree and knowing that I'd probably hurt myself or paralyze my, myself. And then the worst fear was, you know, humiliating myself and coming down from the tree without having done anything. But that's a good time to pray. That's a really good time to pray. Uh, a friend of mine was working in Gibraltar and uh, his working mate, there's like three of them, okay? I mean, two of them believed in, in God, my friend, and this huge guy, they believed in, in God, and the, and the other one was an atheist. And they were having an argument, you know, about the atheist said, well, I don't believe in prayer or anything. And then, and then they're working on like the 20th story of a building on, on, you know, cleaning windows or whatever. And so the big guy just takes the little atheist guy and hangs him off the ledge in midair and says, now are you gonna pray? And I don't recommend that you do that, 
But prayer is powerful. And I like the prayers of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was, in all, was always in these fearful situations. Like he said, should I ask the king if I can leave my job and go back to Jerusalem? And can I get him to pay for it and send me a military guard in the way? Can I do this? Like if I come across in the wrong way, Nehemiah was thinking, he's going to have my head. So Nehemiah felt fear, but what did he do? He did a short prayer under his breath. And I kind of do that. Like if I feel anxiety coming in me, like sometimes I, I do, like fear will enter me. And I just take a deep breath and I just hand it over to God, just say a short prayer and it makes all the difference. And I believe that's what it means to pray continually, like always asking God for strength, always asking God to say, God, I'm walking on the water. I fear the storm. I fear that I'm going to sink. God, I need your help. I can't do it. And in my experience, he always answers you. I remember doing a wedding once, and, and nobody told me what to say, what to do. It was a very prominent wedding. I was walking down. I had no idea what I was going to say. I said, God, I prayed. Help me. Help me. And he did help me, and it was a very successful wedding. Then later, the power of gratitude. If you're feeling down, if you're fearful, just start giving thanks. And it says, give thanks in all circumstances, not in some circumstances, give thanks in all circumstances, even when our son had leukemia, even when I was on the top of that tree, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So what is God's will for you? Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So just a short recap, okay, we're talking about overcoming the fear of failure. Number one, focus on the upside. Don't face failure alone. And number three, focus on the finish line. God bless you.